Hey. Hey, how are you? Good, good. Good to see you. Good. All right. Uh, awesome. I'm going gonna, gonna to let Olga take over for a little bit, but uh, have fun, Olga. You've got a great session ahead of you. Yeah, can I'm you excited. See, can you see my slide? Yes. Okay. We can see your slide and we can see and hear you, and we're very happy about that. So okay. we have Mr. Ghana Shyam Gurung here with us, who is the WWF Nipples country representative. And he's going to be speaking about the state of conservation in the face of climate change in Nepal. Wow. Uh, so without further ado, uh, I suggest that you start. We can't wait to hear. Thank you, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, Welcome to Nepal on virtual tour. So before getting into Nepal, I just would like to remind you all, the health of planet is deteriorating every day and every year. The latest living planet index clearly shows we lost 68% uh, of all our populations in the last 50 years alone. And this is because of our consumption, production, exploitation, and more importantly, that the impact of climate change has a lot to do. And Nepal appears in the Global Climate Risk Index as top 10 country. So because of that, Nepal is part of the Himalayan countries, which is also known as the water towers or the third pole, where the millions depend on the Himalayas in water and billions downstream with the nine major rivers. And this is where most impact of the uh, biodiversity is. In the global context, in average, we lost 84% of the species in the fresh water. Going back to Nepal, in my own hometown, this is the valley, all the pastures that I used to herd my goat and sheep and occasionally yaks, but now that, that's where we stand. We are running out of water only in the major cities, in the, in the groundwater, we are losing water in, in people who are living close to the mountains itself. So this particular, uh, the uh, orchard you see on the riverbed was there's no th way that you could grow apple there, but now they're growing apple because increasing temperature, but people are growing apple is not, not by choice. They have been dis, uh, displaced by the loss of water on the other side of the mountain. So they are in the river beds, which are even more vulnerable from the impact of climate change in terms of fresh floods, erosion, and crop failures. With this, it's not only the lives and livelihoods, it's more importantly, mountain people, agro-pastoralists, uh, the, the pastures being denuded. In my one village, many people had yaks when I was a child. Now we have only last yak herd a documentary was made a few years back and see how the denuded pastures as economic lifeline as sheep and goat and are competing with wildlife, the poor status of the blue sheep you can see here. And as we see, it's no leopard, it indicates the mountain ecology. And sometimes we say these are very elusive, the ghost of the mountains, the reality, for the herders is that everywhere they go, they follow. So they are neither elusive nor ghosts. They are around you all the time. So unfortunately, this is the reality of today of a competition between human livestock and the wildlife and the wild prey. That's how it is working at this stage. And so sadly that we try to work out with the climate change impact under the two degree base scenario, four and six degree worst scenario because the impact of climate change is highest in the mountains. Because that still we saw the possibility of having wildlife corridors between Nepal and China, Tibet, autonomous region and India, a few places is still resilient enough to the species to thrive and people to survive together. And with this, I'm gonna take you to Nepal's conservation journey briefly. Nepal's conservation journey began with the protection of the large species. We call them flagship species, like tigers, rhinos, and elephants. And it was exactly our modern park history began 100 years later, the Yellowstone Park, which is the first modern park in the world. As soon as we protected these species, we immediately realized that we have indigenous people living in every pockets of the mountains, every valleys, Every people are living with the wildlife. So we need to bring people in together to make it sustainable. 
That's the only way to build it. So Nepal's first Annapurna conservation area, which is the largest still, was brought people into conservation forefront. As we begin to have multiple ecosystems and protection, we immediately realize this is not enough. Multiple ecosystems and functions and dispersal of large mammals and other species need a much more larger landscapes. And landscapes, we have uh, two types. One is the altitudinal zone, which is savanna grasslands so all the way to alpine meadows. And the another one, we have river basins with the north to south, where the, uh, the species begin to move upwards in terms of, uh, in terms of uh, latitudinally. So we have a crater parks, and the, in the turns of century, the landscapes. And with landscapes, we also thought is landscapes alone need a much more closer relationship with the south, with India, and north, with also east, west, China, and India together. So we need to survive better in terms of the region. So this is called also the Eastern Himalayas ecoregion, where Nepal, Bhutan, India have worked together for a long time. And we are talking about all the way to Myanmar. This is the whole Eastern Himalayas ecoregion provides the environmental in terms of biodiversity security, water security, energy security, and food security for billions. So taking you briefly to Nepal, despite all the everywhere we lost space, but the space is most important. If you lose, lose space, you lose everything. So Nepal has been fortunate. We have been able to increase our forest cover about 5% in the last 15, 20 years. And we have been able to bring the protected area systems more than 23%. The landscape conservation was brought up, four landscapes, and two or even more in the proposal to be included. And the most recent that this year, the last year is the Biodiversity Summit. Our Prime Minister made a commitment to make 30% of land dedicated to some form of conservation in our language is the people protecting landscapes. And the next space is not only Nepal, as regional skills, as I was telling you earlier, if we are able to protect as transformational uh, space, 12 million hectares from Nepal to Myanmar all the way, the Himalayan will be much more secure. And that India, Nepal, Bhutan continue to work on it with support from our network and other uh, the donors and other communities and uh, foundations. And here, one of the issues to bring two countries, three countries very closely together, India, Nepal, Nepal, China, we have a memorandum understanding with China and also the uh, resolution and close memorandum understanding is in the final stage with, each, uh, with India. And the, there's also to the space, you need to control trade and poaching. For that, we have South Asia Wildlife Enforcement Network and Nepal hosts the secretariat. So quickly take you to the under this, with the, uh, with the space, you have species. So we are almost in the doubling the tiger numbers. And next year, the year of the tiger, they were quite sure we'll reach 250 wild tigers, which is doubling the tiger numbers from the baseline of 121. So the Tarai arc is, you see all the, the lens, the, the map on the next to the tiger is the Tarai arc landscape. It's the most important landscape of the tiger in the world where the India and Nepal shares borders uh, together protecting together. And this is where we have more than tiger, 1,000 tigers, which is under the sea of millions of people, millions of cattle, and hell of a development. While we invested last 12, 11 years uh, largely on the tiger conservation, one of the core benefits brought from the tiger was on the rhino conservation. We, Nepal's journey of a rhino began, as you see on the map in the world, which whole black area in the Indian country, subcontinent was with the rhinos. But it got you know, isolated. So Nepal's population before the malaria eradication was thought to be about 800. So our dream was always to stick to the historic level with 750 to 800 rhinos. If we, were, we dropped to less than 100, we continue to do better. And during the mouse insurgency, we dropped to about 372. And we continue to need to make a progress. While we made a progress, we made a much more better than expected with achieving 752 rhinos this year, uh, better than expected. We have almost achieved the uh, historic rebo record of increasing, reversing the tiger, uh, so reversing the loss of rhino uh, population. And here, because of the rhino zero poaching happened in Nepal in 2011 onwards in six different occasions. So may all over the world, people came to learn from Nepal how the zero poaching was possible. And we were the World Rangers Congress 2019, uh, was happened in first in Asia first time was hosted by Nepal, 
And Nepal is one of the smaller countries in terms of geographical space for snow leopard habitat uh, after Bhutan. But still, we hold the la fourth largest population of snow leopards. Thanks to the local communities, indigenous mountain communities, and local citizen scientists, and continue to have a government and political will to protect the species and with conservation community. The next is wildlife. We have gharials and dolphins. If you look at the map, it's again the subcontinent, in the Indian subcontinent. But we lost all of them, so we have now India and Nepal uh, here. The numbers is still low, but we are doing our best. This one, the biggest challenge under the development and the pollution of the river and, and the quality of rivers uh, getting much more polluted. <clears throat> so with the increasing number of wildlife, now definitely you have more uh, uh, the relationship between human uh, and wildlife and development and conservation has stretched. However, our integrated approach has improved those coexistence in terms of providing, you see the one on the goat in the, in the little uh, corral, which is predator proof corral, so leopards will not lift the goats. And we have people in the middle where the army to local people, men and women together, which are working solutions. Even the, we lost nine people to tigers in the last seven, eight months. And that's where people are still are patient enough to conserve the tigers because there's a cultural pride, there's an integrated approach, there's a relief mechanisms in place, there are livelihoods, there are tourism, and all are related. And more importantly, cultural pride to protecting the species is still runs through the bloods of the local people. And you can see the statement of the rapid response team led by women who clearly says, I'm a volunteer in human wildlife management, uh, conflict management, because I believe that women play roles in their communities and are well placed to foster coexistence. And at the end, more important is the governance. Now, our model of conservation has been prime minister to the people, or you can say people to the prime minister. We have a tiger conservation committee, the highest authority chaired by the prime minister, which all the government mechanisms, machinery manages it from army to police, to security forces, to parks, and all the conservation community together with the local people, more importantly, work together. And hand in hand, you see on the photo, on the, on the, on the one of the corners left, uh, on your right, uh, so there are uh, local women as a citizen scientist and anti poaching youth uh, patrolling parks with the armed uh, army who are dedicated to protection of the parks and also border uh, armed police force and also local communities. And more importantly, the conservation needs to bring direct benefit to people. One map on the green you can see that's called Kansan Jungle Conservation Area, which was the has the high third highest ecology of the world, the Mount Kanchan Janga. As a shares border with the India, Nepal, and China, Tibet Autonomous Region has handed over to local communities in 2006, and people have been successfully managing for the last 15 years. And we have a zero snow leopard retaliatory killing in this until today, and we have been able to bring benefit more than uh, two two million people directly from our interventions. And more importantly, everything uh, in the park needs to be mainstream to the plants. Whether it's a national water plan, national land use plan, national climate change plan, all the species plan, it's, uh, it's mainstreamed climate uh, issues into the plans. So because of that, the government begin to invest more and more on that. Local government, three tiers of government are begin to invest in conservation much more uh, in a mainstreamed way. In this this year, when with Rhino Count happened, first time the government actually invested more than 80% uh, from its uh, uh, on the rhino count uh, in earlier it was conservation communities uh, invested more on that so these are the kind of some of the examples of adaptation at the community level you can see there's a we have a whole huge water reservoirs two water ponds and water holes and the plastic ponds uh, larger green bioengineering to smart and green to sustainable lifestyle organic farming to and one you see under the tree is a is the learning from 15 years back as big as rhino that likes water is also washed away by unpredictable flood that happened in Chiton. And we have to bring uh, 12 rhinos from uh, India back to Nepal. And this is kind of a mount being created as a test to how the animals can climb during the unpredictable floods that come immediately. So with this increase of forest, people's participation, increase of its species all had happened with this particular context. With the, Nepal is still one of the least developing countries. We stand on the top 10 on the climate vulnerable index, and we are still in the governance. Corruption is still high, 
And also we had 10 years of insurgency, 10 years of a political instability, 6 to 16 as a constitution making, and three years back when we had a, 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 this stable government with almost two third majority, we thought we are done with political instability and not yet. And it's politically, it's, most, it's still unstable and, we are, and further uh, situation been even put in much more stress by the COVID. With all of that, we have achieved that uh, level of a conservation dream. And we believe that we can do it again and we can do it, many countries can do it. So take you through to the challenges, the COVID is the one because we believe uh, Nepal economy relies on lots of uh, uh, remittance. And people from Gulf had to return after closure of the uh, losing their jobs. Lots of people lost lives, jobs, economy. All of that has a lots of impacts directly exploitation of natural resources from extraction to exploitation to poaching. And you can see people entering to the park was in the multifold. And yet on the other side of it is because COVID has taught a lesson that we need to look after better. There was an expectation most of the investment will go into humanitarian, but doesn't that doesn't seem to that way. It's going to be the investment more balanced, but the conservation also is getting more priority because people are more aware of it. People are know about zoonotic diseases and because of their nature, one health, people are getting better message from the political top leadership to the people on the ground. And the green enterprises, people are beginning to adopt sustainable lifestyle. And it's a sustainable lifestyle, not only subsistence, it's also on an economic level. The one is the organic uh, coffee and the production of homestays. All the ecotourism uh, was the tourism was one that lost the biggest hit by the, the uh, COVID. Because our park revenue generated from the tourism into tourism revenue was 50% flow back to the community. And that has been halted for the last two years. And this is why still the people continue to function with the domestic tourism, with all the COVID protocols in place. So this is something people still believe the conservation is the key to uh, sustain in terms of ecological services and future for enterprise, green enterprises and also tourism to come back. And as we have achieved zero rhino poaching as a dream in the world, no one has done it. But next dream to achieve is zero trade and zero transit. While the a billion Asians will say no to wildlife trade, Nepal would like to achieve a zero transit as we are now considered as a transit country between India and China. And this is the one that we believe we're going to achieve. As we have been underdeveloped, and now the development has taken place in a much more faster rate in South Asia, one of the fastest growing in terms of a linear infrastructure, whether it's railway, roadway, irrigation canals, hydropower, everything, and including the elephants and the livestock depredation by wildlife and uh, property and uh, property and human lives lost to the elephants, uh, and also lots of uh, uh, development that uh, losing the elephants to tigers lost with the heat by uh, trains and the cars. And this is something we really need to improve more, has got a huge challenge, but we see this challenge can overcome. We make that better as a smart green infrastructure. You look at the roads, uh, 50, 20 years back, the roads were connected from India, south. But now under the Belt and Road Initiative, some of the tentacles are coming from the China to Nepal. Lots of more roads, 10, 12 of them in plan. Many of them already on work. That this is what I was standing on the pillar. It's called Korala, which is one of the major roads in coming through my village. Uh, and there you can see the linear infrastructure. If you look at the river systems, the uh, this uh, green survey, uh, the blue license, uh, red survey, if all put in a place we will hardly have any rivers left for free flow, uh, hardly any stretches, which will have a huge impact on aquatic, life, uh, aquatic species and particularly migratory uh, species, which needs a much more bigger space for mahasir to dolphins to gharials and all of that. And having said that, there's a future to it. We've been constantly working the last five years with the government of Nepal, with Asian Development Bank, World Bank, uh, and uh, creating a smarter infrastructure. There's wildlife to cross underneath, overpasses and underpasses. At the same time, uh, for the irrigation and the roads, and also that's also passing for the, uh, the water when it's a flooding happens, because otherwise it's going to be inundated in many uh, will lose loss. So this is the future we see. And the climate and the disasters are on the rise. And you see the river is the biggest problem. I was saying this is one of the biggest problems all over the place. We really need to work more and more consistently on that, which we haven't done in the past much. But this more needs a focus. And this is a loss of property is everywhere. It's not only that. 
This year we got a most polluted city in Kathmandu for 10, 15 days because the smoke, uh, prolonged drought has created lots of wildfires caught, and you have floods coming in. Even flights are redirected, and flights get uh, skidded out of runway. So this is a hell of a, a challenge under the climate change. So with this, I just want to say uh, the conservation. Is, is a long-term commitment, long-term investment. It is a science-based, and more importantly, it is an art. Combination of science and art can make a transformational impact in conservation for people and nature together. So these two pictures are going to portray you a beautiful woman with lots of jewelries underneath her is a tiger skin. She's wearing. The tiger is looking on the, on, on the other side, getting confused, where's my future? The future is with that us. We have to make the change, and it can be changed with the middle path where you really need to have a balance of act. And balance of act can only happen. The, uh, the, uh, the COVID has taught us enough. The collective realization, their nature cannot be taken for granted. The only option, the only option is build back better and greener. And with that, we really need to reevaluate our actions from consumptions to protections to exploitation. And for that, we need to reevaluate our systems and systems to make it a functional, effective. And we need to have structures, and that needs to be done with the human spirit. And with that, only the re we need to restart. Even though it's uh, still all Nepal is under one of the most impacted under the second wave of COVID at the moment, uh, we're under India. Uh, in the population the size, we are even more impacted. In this one, we cannot go back to business as usual. The only that can happen is the youth. The, we have a, have, a, have more than uh, close to 60,000 youth between the age of 16 to 26, which are the future of today, not tomorrow. And they are the one with the technology, with the innovation in technology, solution oriented for the nature-based solutions and the generation that's green in mind and sustainable lifestyle in the one that is upcoming with together, I see a future is possible for uh, Nepal to thrive uh, uh, conservation and people together. Thank you very much. It's all possible together. Well, thank you very much. Um, you have raised a lot of very important issues. Uh, it's it's even hard to estimate which one uh, which one of those that you mentioned is to focus on right now because all of them are crucial. Uh, and uh, uh, I love the question of uh, the priorities being switched due to uh, the overall COVID situation going on in the world. Uh, but well, fingers crossed that um, the humanity will find uh, the, the proper way out to keep the balance, to keep the humans safe and to keep the wildlife, uh, our closest neighbors and friends, the wildlife to keep them safe too. Well, thank you very much um, uh, for your talk. Uh, uh, it was very, very interesting and best of luck uh, in your uh, further work.